This could be the first lecture for the January 25th paramedic refresher for the 2014 Trotwood Fire Rescue refresher. This is a presentation that was put together by Temple College EMS Professions that we are borrowing. I felt like it was a pretty good explanation of neonatology, um, the description of it, how we can treat it, what we need to do, and how we fit into the ALS uh, hierarchy or continuum for the child. Right, so neonatology, um, remember that the newborn is described as the first few hours of life. And then when we we're talking about neonates, we're talking about the first 28 days of life. So this would be from, you know, the, from when they're born to the first 28 days of life. A couple things to go over with morbidity and mortality. Uh, just remember that complications increase as the birth weight decreases. So the smaller the child, the more comorbidities or more problems they have. And then in turn, resuscitation rate of those less than 1,500 grams is about 80%. All right, so these are things that we need to look at um, from, a, I guess, our standpoint. We need to convey to the hospital. These are going to be questions they ask, but it's also things that we need to put into our report. So multiple gestation. So whether the mom has been pregnant multiple times, has had... You know, multiple abortions, uh, multiple miscarriages, that they've had multiple births, you know, pregnancies, but they've been, you know, they've actually had live births. Any kind of inadequate prenatal care. We need to ask them what kind of prenatal care they've had. Have they seen an obstetrician? Do they have an obstetrician? What the name of the obstetrician is? Are they taking prenatal vitamins? Are they, you know, they, when did they start getting prenatal care? You know, if they just started getting it, you know, two weeks ago and they're 38 weeks then you know obviously they had an adequate prenatal care this is something that you know I hope everybody would know you know the mother's age being less than 16 or greater than 35 years old they have a history of perinatal morbidity or mortalities uh, so they've already had a history of um, some kind of morbidity or they've had some kind of a um, abortion or miscarriages in the past Post-term gestation, so we've got a, uh, you know, female that was, the baby was supposed to be born on, you know, January 1st, and now it's the January the 20th, you know, now we're already, you know, 20 days or 19 days past uh, their due date. Drugs and medications, um, we have a big problem around here, unfortunately, with, you know, drugs and medications, in other words, people not knowing any better because they didn't get good prenatal care, um, just a socioeconomic problem. So toxemia, hypertension, diabetes. So if they are preeclampsic or you know, eclamptic, so that's you know where the toxemia comes in, um, or they got the cat scratch fever, so to speak. You've got hypertension, so from the preeclampsia or the eclampsia, so mom is hypertensive. And then diabetes, whether it be they had pre-gestational or gestational diabetes. So premature labor, that's a big deal. You know, female that's due, you know, once again, January 1st, and now they have the baby on November the 10th. You know, that's a very premature labor. Meconium stain, antibiotic fluid, that's something we have to be aware of. We need to know what it looks like. So if it's green or it's a brownish color, you know, that's not a normal amniotic fluid color. Ruptured membranes greater than 24 hours prior to the delivery. So if mom's water broke, but she's waiting on somebody to come get her, or in turn, water breaks and she decides she's going to do a home delivery, and now it's 24 hours prior or later. Use of narcotics within four hours of the delivery. So that's either you know injected or PO. Abnormal presentation, whether it be a uh, you know bruptio or it's a uh, placenta prea or breach prolonged labor or precipitous delivery so we've got uh, you know they're either in labor for a long time or they're going to have the baby like right now and we don't have time to get ourselves prepared prolapse cord so that's either you know we've got either a nuchal cord um, so the cords around the baby's neck or the baby's laying on the cord 
or the cord is presenting, you know, actually vaginally prior to the, the baby actually being present. So that's a bad thing. And then any ab kind of abnormal bleeding, whether it be bright, re bright red, dark red, or, you know, large amounts, copious amounts. So we'll kind of breeze through this stuff real quick. We talked about this in the past, uh, the placenta and what its job is. It's to get rid of waste and to provide nutrients for the baby. So some of the respiratory changes that go on um, in the womb would be, you know, with the fetus, the lungs are filled with fluid, arterioles and the capillaries are closed, and they have a ductus arterius, and we'll go through that a little bit. So once they do have a stimulation of the first breath, they can get mildly acidosed acidotic so they can get that fluid in their lungs become a little acidotic initiation of the stretch reflex in the lungs they could become hypoxic and hypothermic those are the two things that we need to worry about once the baby you know is actually born is making sure that they are not hypoxic so they're in their proper position we're oxygenating appropriately and they're responding appropriately and making sure that we are drying them off and we're wrapping them up with clean towels and clean blankets All right, so ductus arterius. This is not that it's not important, but you know, I just want to kind of breeze through this real quick. Remember that air displaces the fluid, so the pulmonary arterioles and the capillaries open. It decreases the vascular resistance. Blood's diverted from the ductus arterius. The ductus arterius is eventually closes, and persistent fetal circulation. Most of the blood from the center bypasses the liver. That's the ductus venous. And most of the blood passes from the right to the left atria. That's the form, and that happens in the form of ovale. So the extra uterine life, blood diverted from placenta, lungs expand, the change of pressure levels in the heart. There's a picture of the, the form of ovale. Closure, low right arterial pressure, high left atrial pressure. Blood flows backwards towards the right side, and the valve closes. And then some of the cardiovascular changes, they have the closure of the ductus venus. The ductus venus contracts, blood is forced through the liver sinuses. All right, some kind of the uh, congenital abnormalities um, or anomalies. Some of the things that we need to look at, diaphragmatic hernia. So they have a weakening in that muscle um, or in their diaphragm. So whether they are inhaling or exhaling, they can you know, cause hernias. Uh, let's see, the meningeal myelocele, exposed abdominal contents, uh, collenial ostia, the cleft, uh, cleft lift palate, the Pierre Robin syndrome, um, obviously all problems we need to look at from, uh, you know, just a, a cleft palate or a lip. People are born with them all the time. Obviously, they get them fixed. Um, for us, that just becomes quite a bit of a uh, airway problem if we do have to suction them or if we have to intubate them. So, just things we need to look at. All right, so assessment of the newborn. Um, big thing is time of delivery. We need to make sure we know when they're delivered so they know the time of birth. Just a quick refresher on vital signs. Remember, the respiration needs to be between 30 and 60. The heart rate needs to be between 100 to 180. Stock BP is between 60 to 90 millimeters of mercury. It's rare that we even do systolic BPs on um, infants anyways, just because of the cuff, cuff size, and it's hard to gauge it. And their temperature, we need to keep it between about 98 to 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, obviously, the three that are important to us would be the respirations, heart rate, and the temp. Not the systolic BP should be downplayed any. It's just that, you know, I think I could speak for the group and say that us getting a blood pressure on a newborn is fairly hard without having a machine to do it. And I don't feel like we probably had the proper equipment with just our NIVP on our LIPAC 15s. All right, so we need to look at their color, um, central versus peripheral cyanosis. So are they cyanotic just in their core? Do they have, you know, in their core and in their arms and legs? Do they have it just in their arms and legs, but their core is pink? Um, mucosal, mucosal membranes, we need to look at their, you know, is it their eyes, are those dry, their tongue, their lips, their nasal passages, look inside their noses, are those pink and moist, or are they dry, are they white and dry? And organ perfusion, 
So center pulses versus peripheral pulses, the capillary refill. So we want the capillary refill to be brisk. We want their central pulses to be normal. It's hard to get peripheral pulses on kids anyways, but what we do for them is typically we'll judge their peripheral pulses off of the cyanosis that they have peripherally. So if they're peripherally cyanotic, then typically the peripheral pulses are going to be weak. If they are centrally cyanotic, then their central pulses are probably going to be weak. Um, but that's why we check on brachial pulses and we want to check on carotid pulses as well. All right, just a quick rundown of APGAR. Um, remember that APGAR stands for Appearance, Pulse, Grimace, Activity, and Respirations. I'm not going to go through each one of these. Um, I think we all should know that if they're blue all over, they get a zero. If they are blue on their extremities, but they're pink in the middle, they get a one. If they're pink all over, they get a two. If they don't have a pulse, they get a zero. Less than 100, they get a one. Greater than 100, they get a two. If they have no reaction um, to tactile stimulation, they get a zero. If they kind of grimace a little bit, they get a one. If they cry vigorously, they get a two. No movement in their extremities, they get a zero. If they're decorticate or they basically they they don't move their extremities well or they move them centrally, they get a one. If they move their arms and legs, then they get a two. If they're not breathing, they get a zero. If it's weak and slow, they get a one and then a strong cry too. So they can go from a zero to a 10 on an APGAR score. Remember that we do them at one and five minutes postpartum. So after the baby is delivered, one minute, five minutes, fairly important that you do them at one minute and five minutes unless they're already showing some kind of a respiratory or a um, deep depreciation I guess in their um, APGAR scores you they're not breathing well they are obviously in distress then don't wait one minute to start helping them you need to help them right away so 7 to 10 it's a normal infant you want to suction the oropharynx and keep them warm once again you dry them off and then you use a new blanket or a new towel to keep them warm. Don't wrap them in the same blanket that you dry them off with. Apgar 4 to 6, uh, moderate asphyxia. You want to suction your oropharynx, keep them warm, oxygenate them. If a 5 minute score is less than 7, then you want to repeat every 5 minutes for about 20 minutes and then rescore them. 0 to 3, asphyxia, neonat the neonatrium, and the resuscitate aggressively. So, my son had an APGAR of three when he was born at one minute. At uh, five minutes, uh, he was in a seven. So that was from them aggressively, you know, drying him, tactile stimulation, oxygenating him. They had to bag him for a little bit. They had to make sure they kept him dry. They put him under the warmer, just did the whole gamut, and he went from a three up to a seven. So that's... That's definitely good, and obviously he's healthy now, and he has no long-term effects from having a low APGAR score. So scores can be misleading. It says don't work well with the preterm infants, and they're primarily measure the brainstem function. So it kind of tells you how their brainstem is working. And this just reiterates that don't wait till you know, the one minute for an obviously distressed infant. If they are obviously distressed, you need to start fixing them right away. Get your stuff out. Um, don't wait until after the baby's you know, head is crowning for you to start getting your OB kit out. If you're going on an OB call with an imminent delivery, it's okay to get your OB kit out. Um, doesn't necessarily mean you need to open it. Um, if you've got a mom that is you know, in full labor and she's pushing, she's ready to go. If you send somebody out for the cot, if you didn't bring it in with you, whoever goes out to get the cot, get the OB kit out, get it out, get it set up, then bring the cot in. You know, not that you don't need to get them out quickly, but get that stuff ready that way from the time you get her on the cot till the time she hits the medic, that she is now crowning, now you're ready, and you're not, once again, behind the eight ball. Um, preparing your environment means that getting the back of the medic ready, get it warm. Don't let the baby be born into a uh, cold environment. If you're not sweating, then the medic is not hot enough. And also, keeping the back of the medic clean. Um, I can, think we can all agree that I wouldn't want my kid, nor would I want your kid, born in the back of a dirty medic that's got, you know, salt track through it, and it's got blood on the walls, and it's got dirt all over the cot, and, you know, it's nasty and dirty and got crap laying everywhere. Keep the medic clean, keep it, you know, in the optimal 
environment so that way if you end up catching a labor and delivery call right after you leave from the hospital that you're ready and you're not once again behind the eight ball during the delivery you always suction the mouth and the nose as the head delivers remember that kids are obligated nose breathers make sure that you note the amniotic fluid color and the thickness that is very important um, they're not as concerned about meconium staining as in the past because we've done a fairly good job of recognizing it and suctioning appropriately we just need to continue the good work that we've been doing so all we're no oh I spit that out all newborns have difficulty with cold that's because they have a larger body surface area we've talked about that in past lectures that because they have a larger skin surface area they get colder quicker and they get hypothermic a lot easier so you need to make sure that you dry them off get all the goo off of them get all the fluid off of them get a new towel get a new blanket and wrap them in it don't use the same blanket or towel that you wipe them off with because all that cold goo just keeps them hypothermic make sure you dry the infant aggressively wrap them in a warm and dry blanket if you have the aluminum foil wrap use that it says well insulated warm water containers um, we don't have those but what we do have are our IV fluids that are in the IV warmer make sure you put a barrier between the kid you can put those in close proximity to the kid so basically just the heat off of them you know will radiate onto the kid make sure we put them on their back in a slight Schindelenburg position so with the head raised just a little I'm sorry with their legs raised just a little bit one inch thick towel under the shoulders so that way they can actually breathe remember they have big old noggins and they have little bodies because of that they will go into a you know I guess you call it a hyperflex position on their neck um, avoid and avoid being underneath their neck don't put the towel underneath their neck because that gives it over extension and then if the screeches are heavy make sure you place them on the left side so that way they can actually breathe don't lay them you know, they're not laying them flat, so that way the secretions get into their lungs. They can't breathe. So if you have to, you lay them on their left side. So it takes the pressure off of the inferior vena cava. All right, so for us, for suctioning, we use a bulb syringe. We do not use the onboard suction. Using the onboard suction has too much power and pressure. If you can dial it down and you don't have a bulb syringe, you want to dial it down to just about the lowest setting you can on the onboard suction. Once again, don't use it unless you have to. The first choice is the bulb syringe. We always suction the mouth first, then the nose. Remember that neonates are obligated nose breathers. So that's why if we suction their nose first, they're going to take a breath. They can suck in that crap that's in their mouth, and then they end up getting aspirational pneumonia. Or they can get themselves more acidotic from the stuff that they're actually sucking in. Monitor their heart rate for bradycardia. Remember that kids, when they start having respiratory failure, um, neonates they'll become bradycardic before they ever become tachycardic so they compensate by bradycardia and then make sure we suction in the meconium once again uh, from an ALS level we've actually been doing a fairly good job and they're not stressing it as much you know to make sure that you suction out meconium they just want to keep you aware that you need to make sure that you suction it out and you recognize that there is meconium that there actually is fecal matter in the amniotic, in the amniotic fluid So sorry about that. I actually had to stop in the video and then answer my phone. So we we're just talking about meconium. Once again, just make sure that you suction their you know, nose first, and then I'm sorry, their mouth first, and then their nose. Okay. Talked about tactile stimulation. It says flicking the soles of their feet or stroking their back. Um, not that I'm a giant expert on this. I've only delivered a couple kids in the back of the medic, but in the hospital you know, you'd be surprised at how many people came through the ER that actually delivered kids um, and when we did that personally I think that you know stroking their back or you know just running your fingers across their back is a little bit more tactile stimulation than flicking the soles of their feet so evaluate the respiration so spontaneous remember that evaluating the heart rate tells you quite a bit about the respiratory effort so if they've got poor respiratory effort a lot of times they're going to be bradycardic, um, aspirant, or gasping respirations. So sometimes just that brief tactile stimulation will increase the respiratory drive or respiratory rate. Using positive pressure ventilation with 100% oxygen, and you don't want to do this more than about 15 to 30 seconds. 
primary apnea versus secondary apnea. So, you know, keep in mind with primary apnea, that's obviously they were born with apnea versus the child that has a respiratory rate and now because you are not providing oxygen for them or they're becoming hypoxic or they're becoming hypothermic, now they start becoming apneic because of that, because basically you aren't, you know, treating them appropriately. All right, so evaluate their heart rate. Um, anything above 100, make sure that you're evaluating their color. That tells you quite a bit about their heart rate. Once again, they will become bradycardic with their, um, when they're, they'll become bradycardic when the respiratory rate's not up. And then in turn, they will start to, you know, have peripheral cyanosis or core cyanosis. Anything below 60, we're going to continue positive pressure ventilation with 100% oxygen. We initiate compressions. We reevaluate after 30 seconds. And then we initiate any kind of medications if it's below 80. So um, that's when we start giving, because of bradycardia, we start giving them epinephrine. A heart rate between 60 to 100. <clears throat> Excuse me. The heart rate's not increasing. We continue with our positive pressure ventilation with 100% oxygen. Give them the compressions. 30 seconds, we initiate the medications if it's below 80. And then if their heart rate starts increasing after the 30 seconds, then we just continue to positive pressure ventilation because we don't want them becoming hypoxic anymore and becoming bradycardic again. So with central cyanosis, provides a free flow of oxygen. It says when they're pink, gradually remove the oxygen and if no improvement, consider the positive pressure ventilation with 100% O2. Um, remember that us blowing oxygen in their face um, it's kind of like when you put your face in the wind. You, you know, you remember when you were a kid and you tried to put your head out the window, and the wind blowing in your face, you kind of you couldn't catch your breath. It's no different than we have, you know, we have 15 liters per minute coming out of a O2 tubing, and we got a blowing in a kid's face. They can't catch their breath, so that actually can make them more hypoxic. So you just want blow by oxygen. Blow by oxygen literally means like it's just running by their face. It's not blowing in their face. And then acrocyanosis, so observe and monitor for any kind of acrocyanosis or, you know, peripheral cyanosis. That's another name for acrocyanosis. All right, so meconium deliveries, it's about 10 to 15% of the deliveries. Some of the risk factors will be fetal distress and post-term infants. Complications from meconium, hypoxemia, which I would hope everybody would know. You can, you know, get very sick from that stuff. Um, in turn, you can get respiratory infections, aspirational pneumonia, pneumothoraxes, and then pulmonary hypertension. All right, so this is only in a depressed infant. So if you've got a meconium and a depressed infant, this isn't just a meconium stain, and then we do all of this. This is a child that is depressed with meconium. Do not stimulate them. In other words, no, tile, no tactile stimulation, nor in their back, no flipping their feet, um, because you don't want them basically getting excited and breathing. Tracheal suction under direct visualization. So that when you stop doing tracheal suctioning is when their airway is clear, the infant starts breathing on their own, or you lower their, they become bradycardic. So they go from that, you know, 80, and then now we're down into the 60s, and the, you know, you try again, and it's 55, and then it's 40. So you stop doing that, and then we make sure that we, we want to ventilate them with 100% oxygen. After we are done, after we hit that end point, we ventilate with 100% oxygen. All right. Uh, you know, for us, you know, we're going to low, we need to turn it down on a low setting for the meconium. We make sure that we use one of our, uh, either a 10 French or a 14 French catheter. So a little bit of history on diaphragmatic hernia. So it's one in 2200 live births. It's most commonly on the left side. It's a failure of the pleural peritoneal canal, or the foreman or the banca look, whatever that may be, um, to the close completely. 50% survival of mechanical ventilation required, and this is a near 100% survival with no respiratory stress. So if the kid's got a diaphragmatic hernia, they have no respiratory stress, 100% survival, only 50% survival if it's mechanical ventilation is required. So if we have to bag them, or put them on a vent with a diaphragmatic hernia in order for them to breathe, they only have about a 50% chance of surviving. So, little to severe stress usually is present from birth. Uh, they'll have dyspnea or a cyanosis, unresponsive ventilation, oxygenation. 
scaphoid abdom, abdomen, bowel signs, and her thorax. Um, we talked about this, so basically, and I, I think I said it in this portion, um, you know, if you start listening to their chest and you hear bowel sounds, you know, up in their chest, that's not a good thing. That means that they do have some kind of diaphragmatic hernia. They've got that weakening in their, in their diaphragm. And then the heart sounds are displaced to the right. Things that we can do if we do hear this, we want to elevate the head and chest because we don't want, if lying them down, that means that the bowels, the abdominal contents are going to end up in their chest. It says intubation as needed. Do not use a bag valve mask on them because we don't want to increase the pressure in their chest. Or a gastric tube, low intermittent suction. So, also we're not doing OG tubes or NG tubes right now. But, you know, we talked about this the first day of the paramedic refresher. Um, we are looking at NG tubes and OG tubes from a curriculum standpoint. So, it may not currently be in our curriculum in this area, but... It could be in the near future. And it says it requires a surgical repair. So it's something that you know, obviously we're not going to fix in the field. Causes of bradycardia, hypoxia, increased endocrineal pressure, hypothyroidism, and acidosis. So some of the things that we can help with is the hypoxia and the acidosis. Um, so the hypoxia, obviously with us oxygenating them appropriately and ventilating them appropriately, and then acidosis, making sure we ventilate them and Appropriately. So if it's any kind of a respiratory acidosis, we don't want to get make it any worse. Or if it is a metabolic acidosis, um, we do have bicarb available. Pardon me. However, it's not in our protocol, um, but that is something that's you know pre-hospital that you may see in the near future from an acidosis standpoint. If we're able to do any kind of ABGs, uh, then we're able to tell if they're acidotic or not. We may be able to give them. Sodium bicarbonate. So right now, things that we can fix is simply ventilating them and oxygenating them properly to help with the hypoxia and the acidosis. And it says a minimal risk if it's corrected quickly. So if we start seeing them decompensating and becoming bradycardic, um, they were at 100 beats per minute. Now they're down to 60, and now they're down to 50, or they go from 100 down to 80, down to 70, and we watch them. If it's something that we can fix correctly and quickly then typically they don't become bradycardic. They'll let them get down into a lower range. Upper airway um, for obstruction, so any kind of foreign object, whether that be um, a clot, mucus, um, make sure we get that out, any kind of secretions in their nose or their mouth. We need to make sure that we use a bulb syringe first. Once again, if you don't have a bulb syringe available, which you should because it's in the OB kit, but for any goofy reason you don't have it, it's the lowest setting on your onboard suction. Now, the tongue and the tongue and the soft tissue is a big airway obstruction and because they've got those big giant tongues and they may not have the muscle to keep that tongue out of the out of their airway and that's just simply you know elevating their head a little bit to keep their tongue from causing an airway obstruction and then hypoventilations in other words they are not taking a good they have shallow respirations which in turn can make them bradycardic so things that we can help with with the bradycardia Positioning them, suctioning them, making sure that we don't let their heart rate get below 60. If it's less than 100, we can use bag valve mask 100% O2, and then we reassess them. If the heart rate is less than 60, we're using chest compressions with the bag valve mask. If it's between 60 and 80, but they're not improving chest compressions, and then maintaining their temperature, that's a big one, is keeping their temperature up um, you know, above that 98 degrees. So once again, we want between 98 to 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And just reassessing them and making sure that their temperature is not getting low. Uh, remember that you know these kids may be peeing, um, so if they start peeing everywhere, reassess your blanket because if they are normally you know they were at a normal temperature and now they seem to be becoming um, hypothermic, um, find out why. Have they peed inside the blanket? So you may have to change out that blanket multiple times to keep it warm. Remember to discontinue your chest compressions when the heart rate hits 100 or above. Um, pharmacological, we want to use epinephrine as a last resort. But if you do have to use epinephrine, that's the only medication that we give for the bradycardia. We went over this before. Premature infants is a, you know born prior to the 38 weeks gestation, uh, weighing less than 2.2 kilograms or 4 pounds 13 ounces. 
Healthy infants are weighing uh, less than 1,700 grams or 3 pounds 12 ounces, have good prognosis, and at fetal viability considered between about 23 to 24 weeks gestation. So some of the complications that arise from having a premature infant, um, respiratory suppression, head and brain injury, hypothermia, a change in the blood pressure, hypoxemia, intraventricular hemorrhage, and fluctuations in the serum osmolarity. A lot of times they'll have a larger trunk. Um, they'll have shorter extremities. They have very transparent skin, um, kind of like the elderly. Their skin is very thin, so we can see vessels and we can see them breathe, which is good and bad. Turn a lot less wrinkles, and they have a lot less subcutaneous fat, which in turn makes them uh, make them cold very easy um, because they don't have the fat content. So now they will become very hypothermic. So for a premature infant, it's the same as a full-term newborn, and we always have appropriate facility. So for us, um, Good Samaritan Hospital, Miami Valley Hospital are the two most appropriate. Um, children's Hospital, we usually don't transport to just because they want to be able to take care of the mom and the baby. Um, if you're not dealing with mom and you've got some kind of a problem with the baby, Children's is appropriate. Um, we don't transport to Grandview. Remember that because they don't have a L and D. So their equivalent to L and D would be Southview. So for us, Good Samaritan, um, Kettering if you have to, but or Miami Valley. So it just gives a respiratory stress of cyanosis. Is prematurity is the most common factor. It's most frequently in infants less than 1,200 grams or two pounds 10 ounces, or 30 weeks gestation or below. Multiple gestation is a prenatal maternal complications. Um, so this is where we're going to see that cyanosis or restorative stress. So if they're a premature, you know, preemie, mom has had a bunch of babies, or has been pregnant a bunch, has had multiple miscarriages, or the mom basically is doing drugs, um, alcohol, not getting the prenatal care that they need to. This is immature central respiratory control center, easily affected by the environmental metabolic changes. So um, taking them from a warm atmosphere to a cold atmosphere can affect it with respiratory stress and cyanosis, any kind of lung or heart disease, aspiration, shock, sepsis infection, diaphragmatic hernia, central nervous system disorders, and any airway obstruction. So out of that big giant list, things that we can help with is keeping them warm, making sure we keep them oxygenated. We make sure that there's no nothing in that they can aspirate on. We always make sure that we monitor their temperature. We make sure that we monitor their respiratory rate, make sure we monitor their heart rate we don't let them get you know near anything that can make them septic and as the words like the aspirational pneumonia we make sure we suction them well same thing for infection we can't prevent all infection but we make sure we don't expose them to any kind of out um, outdoor or any kind of atmospheric um, abnormalities diaphragmatic hernia we can't fix central nervous system disorders we can't fix airway obstruction if it's something that we can fix, something we can suction out, then we get it out. But we need to make sure that we, if we are going to suction them, is a very, very minute and minimal time. All right, so some of the assessment findings that we may have is tachypnea. So in other words, their blood pressure, I'm sorry, their, uh, that thing, respiratory rate is extremely high. Paradoxical breathing. So they've got that belly, chest breathing. Um, it's paradoxical in other words it's not you know symmetrical it's asymmetrical periodic breathing intercostal retractions we've talked about this before so if we've got you know in between their you know rib cage or supraclavicular retractions um, suprasternal retractions or substernal retractions so they've got that you know super ep or epigastric retractions which would be you know right below their xiphoid process super clavicular retractions, so up at the collarbones, suprasternal retractions, so up, you know, above the sternum, or intercostal retractions, any kind of nasal flaring, and excretory grunting. Remember, the excretory grunting can cause CPAP or PEEP, um, which in turn, you know, you don't want the, that continuous positive airway pressure. It's kind of like a COPD patient. You start putting too much air into them, they can't get rid of that air, and then they end up with pneumos. So for us, for management and airway breathing, 
We position them, we suction them, we give them high concentration of oxygen. We intubate them as needed. We make sure we do positive pressure ventilation as needed. Compressions, anything less than 80, we make sure we do compressions on them um, in circulation and make sure we maintain their warmth. So this is seizures. So that's something that is rare in the newborn population. Um, it indicates a serious underlying medical abnormality. So we're usually not going to see the febrile seizure in a newborn. Um, so we have to keep that in mind. It probably means they have some kind of a central, central nervous system abnormality or anomaly. Prolonged frequent seizures may result in the metabolic and cardiopulmonary difficulties. So it is not good for these kids like anybody to be in a status um, epilepticus. So we need to get rid of the seizure. However, keep in mind that you know giving them any kind of sedative in turn is going to lower their respiratory drive. If they already have a crappy respiratory drive because of the seizure, you're just going to make it worse. So it's kind of a double-edged sword. So tonic-clonic seizures says typically do not occur in the first month of life. Um, subtle seizures, so eye deviation, blinking, sucking, swimming movements, apnea, changing in color. These are things we have to be aware of. Um, I took a patient in, and this was an adult patient, but it just kind of goes with the story. Um, took a patient in, this has been you know, a long time ago, and they were rubbing their fingers together. And other than that, really, they were responding appropriately to me, talking to me, but they were rubbing their fingers together. Doctor walked over, fairly smart doc, said, this person's having a seizure. And I said, they're not having a seizure. And they're talking to him. And they were rubbing their fingers. He told them to stop. And they couldn't stop. And basically, they were having a very subtle seizure. And we just completely missed it. Because I saw them rubbing their fingers together, but I didn't put two and two together. So it's just those subtle little things. So the eye deviation, um, them blinking, sucking. Obviously, they can't talk to us. Um, they can't respond the way that you know a kid responds. Or I'm sorry, the way that an adult responds. So just little things we have to keep in mind. Um, tonic seizures, the posturing of their extremities or their trunk, so that whether they be decorticate or decerebrate, so whether they're you know pointing towards the core or they're going away from their core, more common in premature infants. And this is in ventricular hemorrhages, intraventricular hemorrhage. Focal clonic seizures, arrhythmic twitch of the muscle group, it says it can migrate to other areas. Um, multifocal seizures, so multifocal groups involved can migrate to other areas. Myoclonic, that generalized jerks to extremities, may occur singly or repetitively. Singly or repetitively. Some of the causes of hypoxia, I'm sorry, of seizures. Hypoglycemia, sepsis, fever, infection, developmental abnormalities, and drug withdrawal. So things that we can help with. Um, obviously checking their blood sugar, you should do this on a kid anyways. Checking for hypoglycemia to make sure that their you know, blood sugar is not low. Sepsis, once again, it's not something that we can fix but we can definitely help keep it from people getting or the baby getting septic a fever um once again we can't give them antibiotics we can't lower their fever we can't give them tylenol um however if they are feverous we need to make sure we relay that to the hospital any kind of infection the developmental abnormalities we can't fix and then drug withdrawal we just need to Make sure we ask the parents, ask the mom if they've done any drugs to be honest with us. I know sometimes it's hard, they have a hard time admitting it, um, but if we can let them know that not knowing, this may be detrimental to their child. So we have to know what medications they took because, uh, you know, for example, I have friends of mine that uh, they adopted a baby and the baby started having rhythmic jerking. Couldn't figure out what the problem was. Kept going through, you know, they thought that the baby actually was withdrawing from heroin. And so they started doing all these tests. No, the baby doesn't have heroin. Maybe it's withdrawing from cocaine. No, no cocaine. So they did all the tests. Nothing. They're like, oh, my God, you know what is wrong with this baby? So they started, you know. So finally, they went back. They talked to the mom that, um, you know, had the baby. And what it was is she was drinking energy drinks while she was pregnant. And the baby was actually withdrawing from energy drink. So it really wasn't a seizure um, as much as it was just kind of had that, you know, had that movement, had that jerking motion, which they thought was a seizure, which they thought was withdrawing from a drug. But in fact, the baby was actually withdrawing from energy drinks. So assessment, um, decreased level of consciousness and seizure activity. 
things that we need to look for. You know, once again, we're looking at APGARs. We're looking at just from a neonatal standpoint. Um, you know, so this is after, you know, obviously the baby's at home, the first 28 days of their life. Are they less responsive? Did they, you know, is the mom and dad noticing that they're sleeping more? So these are all things for, you know, level of consciousness. You know, essentially, we need to be aware of any kind of subtle seizure activity. Things that we need to do, we need to make sure they maintain their ABCs. We give them high concentration of oxygen. Um, we give them benzos, the volumes and the versets if we can. We give them D25 um, if we can. We maintain their warmth and we make sure we get them to the hospital. When I say you get them to the hospital, the rapid transport, this is not Good Samaritan Hospital. This is not Miami Valley. If they have a patent airway, you need to bypass those hospitals and you need to get them to Children's Hospital. I always try to equivalent it to um, I don't want my proctologist or my gastroenterologist cracking my chest and doing open heart surgery. Just because they're a doctor doesn't mean that they don't have a subspecialty. Um, those hospitals, yes, they can take care of kids, um, but they're going to do exactly what we're going to do. They're going to call Children's Medical Center. They're going to have their transport come and pick up the kid, get them out of the hospital, and get them to the appropriate place. For us, it's that extra 10 minutes by us bypassing those hospitals to get them to Children's Hospital. It saves that 10 minutes from the transport unit having to come from children's and another 10 minutes back. So basically you're saving a 10 minutes worth of critical treatment that that child may need by getting them by bypassing to what I would consider adult hospitals to get them to the appropriate facility. A fever in a child is going to be anything greater than 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit. Life-threatening condition, limited ability to control their temperature and they have an increased use of glucose which may lead to the anaerobic metabolism so make sure that we are aware that if their temperature is above 100.4 that is a problem irritability um, if they are um, somber or um, somnolence they've got you know basically they just are very quiet they are not reactive babies should be active if they are very, you know, non-reactive, not moving extremities, um, any kind of decreased intake. Uh, so for us, you know, we always talk about this, ways that we can gauge decreased intake or if we can tell if they are, you know, hypovolemic is the urine output. We start looking at how much are they taking in, how much are they putting out. Are they taking in as much as they're putting out? Um, any kind of rashes or petechiae, so just like the broken blood vessels is what the petechiae would be. How are they sweating? This is on brow only of the newborn new of term newborns, and not present on pre on premature newborns. So are they sweating? Management this is assure adequate oxygenation, avoid rapid cooling, avoid the cold packs, and avoid any any pyretic agents. So that would be like we're not giving them temperature or I mean Tylenols. We're not giving them. Advil, you know, no ibuprofens, no acetaminophens. Do not put cold packs on them. Do not try to rapidly cool them. Um, remember that a lot of the febrile seizures, part of the problem is that, is that temperature variation. It's that rate of rise for their temperature. And that's what ends up causing the seizures itself. So as infants can't tolerate temperatures that are comfortable to adults. Um, so what is comfortable to me is not comfortable to a kid. Once again, the back of the medic if you're not sweating they're not warm period hypothermia is anything less than 95 degrees in an infant um, or a neonate increased surface to volume ratio we talked about that they have a larger skin surface so they get colder quicker they can be an indicator of sepsis which can lead to metabolic acidosis pulmonary hypertension and hypoxemia so acrocyanosis or the you know cyanosis in the limbs only irritability Lethargy, pale or cool to touch, respiratory distress or apnea, bradycardia, and says newborns do not shiver. So kids, remember that newborns, when we're looking at that neonate newborn thing, newborns, they're just, they don't shiver. So you're not going to see them shivering there. Basically, they start showing from lethargy, irritability, their extremities are cold and cyanotic. That could be for hypothermia. So we need to ensure their adequate oxygenation and ventilation. 
we always do chest compressions if they're uh, temp or I'm sorry if they're rest yeah that thing heart rate is below 80 we warm the infant ambient temperature we cover the infant and we always give them warm IV fluids that's a big one warm IV fluids um, once again they don't tolerate the temperatures that we have so the IV fluids that we have sitting on a shelf of our medic especially this time of year you know so we're looking at mid-January our medics are sitting in the bays you know our temperature in our bays is not 90 degrees you know we're sitting in the 60s and the 50s and our bays is sitting in the back of the medic or you know we got a medic that's sitting outside at one of the local hospitals and our IV fluids are not going to be warm you need to give them warm IV fluids and not normal temperature IV fluids anything less than 45 millig ah, milligrams per deciliter um, so anything less than 45 is hypoglycemic in an infant. It says causes is do not have to have diabetes mellitus, inadequate glucose stores, inadequate intake, increased glucose utilization, and stress. So these are all things that we, you know, we need to make sure that once again we warm them up, make sure they got a good respiratory drive, and if they have anything less than 45 milligram, milligrams per deciliter, we make sure that we give them fluid. When in doubt, you have a Hey, a blood sugar, call the hospital, say, this is what I got. What do I need to do? Should I give them any kind of D25? Or D10, I'm sorry. And hypoglycemia. So, twitching seizures, limpness, lethargy, eye rolling, high-pitched cry, apnea, and irregular respiration is the best thing for us. It's just a simple user glucometer. This is things that we need to look for. Um, pretty much any infant. Uh, it's okay to take a blood sugar on them because, once again, they don't present the same way that you and I do for hypoglycemia. It says, in all sick infants require a blood glucose assessment. So, you know, obviously, you know, if the kid is just presenting because they've got a uh, snotty nose or, you know, a head injury, you know, because, you know, whatever they fell, that is not a glucose assessment, you know, criteria. However, one, you're not going to hurt the kid by doing a glucose assessment. Two, if you have to think about it, you probably need to do it. So if it even crosses your mind like, eh, should I or shouldn't I, do it. And because, you know, no kid has ever died from getting a glucose assessment. However, several have been critically ill. And, you know, I don't want to say died, but I'm sure there are kids out there that have died because they did not get a glucose assessment or did not get a glucometer use. So we ensure they're adequate oxygenation ventilation. We do an IV or an IO, um, depending on, you know, remember that kids that are critical, we do IOs and we do tibial IOs. We make sure we do an EKG on them or an ECG, give them D10 or D25 and, you know, whatever is sitting in the drug bag for the day and make sure we maintain their warmth. Vomiting says rare during the first weeks of life, uh, may be confused with regurgitation. So they may just have a, you know, GERD basically they have gastroesophageal reflux disease. They may just be, and this is where like the mylocon and stuff like that comes in. Um, Life threatening if it contains blood, symptom underlying problem, upper digestive tract obstruction, increased intracranial hemorrhage or any kind of infection, and it may lead to dehydration electrolyte imbalance. So um, a kid that is vomiting quite a bit, we need to be aware of that. That's when we start looking at sunken fontanelles, sunken eyes, mucous membranes. You know, the nose, the mouth, um, their gums, their tongue. That is all stuff that is very indicative of dehydration, and we have to be aware of that. Distended stomach, you know, that's a big problem. Any kind of infection, increased endocranial pressure. That's where we start looking at fontanelles. If their fontanelle is bulging, they may have an increased endocranial pressure. Um, if it is sunken, same thing. It could be, it could also mean that they have. If they have a sunken fontanelle, they actually could be hypovolemic and any kind of drug withdrawal. Uh, once again, I just told, told you a couple slides back about a, you know friends of ours that the kid was actually withdrawing from energy drinks, which you know 10 years ago you wouldn't even have thought of. It. You know today, you know they sell energy drinks like they sell bottled water, so um, it happens. And if you haven't ran across it, I'm pretty sure. You know, you'll end up running across it at some point in your career. So, we maintain a patent airway. So, we make sure that they don't become hypoxic from an airway obstruction. We make sure we suction 
if we have to. We want to make sure we oxygenate them. Any kind of vagal stimulation may cause bradycardia. So that's where, if we do have to suction them, that's what we end up, what ends up happening. And in turn, if they are vomiting profusely or they are, you know, constantly vomiting, uh, to stimulate their vagal uh, nerve, and then in turn, when they have the vagus nerve stimulated, they have a vagal, vagal vasovagal response, and then they become bradycardic and they get sicker. So IV of normal saline, a TKO, if it's concerned about dehydration. So once again, you're not going to hurt them by starting the IV um, of normal saline. However, by not giving them fluid, if they do need it, um, you are hurting them. So diarrhea, the description of that is five to six stools per day, per day is normal. Um, anything above that, and when we're looking at the consistency of it, it says it can lead to dehydration, electrolyte imbalance. Um, so look at the consistency. Anybody that has kids should know what a normal, consistent um, bowel movement looks like. If it is pure water, that is not normal. It has to have some kind of a little bit of consistency. Obviously, you know, a kid's or a newborn's poop is not uh, extremely solid, and it should not be solid. If it's solid, that's a bad thing. Um, you know, it needs to be a normal consistency. But pure water is not consistent, and anything over six per day is not normal. So some of the causes, bacterial viral infection, so color has a lot to do with it. Um, gastroenteritis, phototherapy, um, this is thyrotoxicosis, and cystic fibrosis. All right, so looking at loose stools, decreased urinary output, um, listlessness, prolonged capillary refill, and the number of diapers per day. Um, that's a big one. That's actually something you need to make sure you document in your run report is how many diapers the kid has went through in a day, um, how often, how soiled are they when mom and dad change them? Um, how much urine versus diarrhea is it? Um, is it flowing out the sides? Was it just a little bit? So that's something that you need to make sure that you do document in your run report and you convey to the ER staff. So we always ensure they're adequate oxygenation. We make sure we maintain their temperature. And then we start an IV of normal saline if we're concerned about dehydration. Um, some avoidable and unavoidable trauma during labor and delivery. Uh, there's things that you can help, some things you can't help. There's no doubt about that. You just have to make sure that, um, so that's both for the mom and for the baby. Uh, things that we cannot avoid. Um, so if the mom has a, uh, a small birth canal, in other words, their cervix is smaller, child has a larger head, there may be trauma from that. Um, like my son. When he was born, and of course my wife being a physician kind of ran into quite a few problems. Um, he had this big, like gelatinous mass on his head, which in turn, you know, we were concerned about. We ended up having a neonatologist look at him. He had to sleep on a special pillow. I know, imagine that, you know, being my kid, you know, he got a funky looking head. But anyways, um, it was because they had to use the, uh, the vacuum on his head. Because he was not being born, my wife um, having a smaller cervix, kid having a big old giant cranium, you know, because he had a big head, smaller cervix, they had to use the vacuum, and when they used that, it actually created this, like, big gelatinous mass on his head. It went away within about two days, um, actually about three days, but anyways, so there's the things you can unavoid, but now avoidable trauma, you know, obviously dropping the kid, making sure that, uh, you know, the mom, once again, I said this in a prior lecture that women have been having babies long before paramedics were ever invented. So, you know, they have them on toilets, they have them in beds, they have them when they're walking. So, unavoidable trauma. It says that birth injuries occur in about two to uh, seven of every 1,000 live births. Five to eight of every 100,000 die of birth trauma. 25 of every 100,000 die of anoxic injuries. And two to three percent of infant deaths. So it accounts for about 2 to 3% of the infant deaths. So cranial injuries, says molding the head, overriding the uh, parietal bones. Skull fractures, um, subperisteal hemorrhage, subconjunctival and retinal hemorrhages, erythemia, abrasions, ecchymosis, and subcutaneous fat necrosis. All right. So... Intracranial hemorrhage should be caused from trauma or asphyxia. 
spinal cord damage, traction when the spine is hyperextended. So basically if the baby is being born, you don't want to grab a hold of her head and pull because if the shoulders are stuck and you start pulling and turn, that causes spinal cord damage and then us pulling laterally. So any kind of peripheral nerve damage, liver or spleen ruptures, clavicle and uh, extremity fractures. So if you, if they are not expelling right because of, you know, once again, the cervix or the, um, they get stuck on the symphysis pubis of the female, then they can end up with clavicle fractures, um, hypoxia, and then ischemia. So edema, ecchymosis of the soft tissues or the bruising of the soft tissues. Um, paralysis below the level of spinal cord injury, paralysis of the upper arm with or without paralysis of the forearm, hypoxia, and then shock. Um, all things that we need to be aware of. Things that we can do for birth injuries. Once again, this is kind of a broken record. Sure, inadequate ventilation, doing chest compressions as needed. You do pharmacology as needed, and make sure you keep them warm. So cardiac arrest, we've talked about this in the past. This is, you know, nothing new to anyone. That most cardiac arrests in the newborn and the neonate population is primarily related to hypoxia. So it starts usually as a respiratory problem, ends up being respiratory failure, then they go into respiratory arrest, and then they in turn digress into a cardiac arrest or progress into a cardiac arrest. Outcome is poor if the interventions are not initiated quickly. So we that's where we come into effect. That's why kids decompensate so quickly is because they can go from zero to sick like now. So we have to make sure that we intervene and we're trying to get them before they ever go into the respiratory failure section. So if they're having respiratory distress, we don't want them to progress into a respiratory failure, respiratory arrest, and turn into a cardiac arrest. So risk factors, intrauterine asphyxia. Um, so if they are having trouble if they're basically prolonged birth and they are becoming hypoxic or they're going without air, then they're going to become asphyxiated. Prematurity, so they're born, you know, prior to the uh, 37 week. Drugs administered or taken by the mother. Congenital neuromuscular diseases, congenital malformations, and the intraperitoneum partum hypoxemia. So primary apnea, secondary apnea, bradycardia, pulmonary hypertension, and persistent fetal circulation. Bottom line, apnea leads to cardiac arrest. Bradycardia, because they're not perfusing right, which in turn, if they're not perfusing right, then that means they're not ventilating right, which means they're not oxygenating right. If they're not oxygenating, they're not ventilating, which in turn is going to cause bradycardia, which in turn is going to progress into cardiac arrest. Pulmonary hypertension, big problem, and then persistent fetal circulation. Central cyanosis, inadequate respiratory effort, and then effective or absent heart rate. Um, very important. That's why we need to make sure that when we are doing CPR, we need to make sure that we're oxygenating them because oxygenation with the compressions is what the kid needs because us just circulating non-oxygenated blood is not going to help them because, once again, they need oxygen in order for their organs to perfuse. And by just doing compressions without oxygenated blood, um, it's basically like peeing in the wind. All right, so for the inverted triangle, we're drying and warming positioning suction tactile stimulation. So these are the first things that we do. Keep them warm, keep them dry, make sure they're in a proper position, suction them as needed, and keeping them stimulated. Then we provide oxygen, whether it be by blow-by, and then we start giving BVM ventilations. If that's not working, then we do chest compressions. If that's not working, we intubate them. Last resort is meds. So keep them warm, keep them dry, keep them in a good position, stimulate them, give them blow by oxygen, progress into bag valve mask or positive pressure ventilations, do chest compressions when it's less than 80, when they're first born, less than 60 for anyone that's in the neonatal population, intubation, and then last but not least, meds. Keep them dry, keep them warm, position suction, evaluate respirations, evaluate the heart rate, so as most suppressed infants will respond to warming positioning, suction, um, stimulation. If they're pale or cyanotic, give them oxygen until they're pink. It says mass tent over the head with a sheet or hold the mass near their face. Flow at a four to five liter per minute. Um, where it says mass tent over their head with a sheet or hold. That's fairly easy. Just put a sheet over top of them. Um, 
it's a tent. It's not laying it on top of them. It's just laying it across them. And you want it to flow at about four to five liters per minute. Avoid any kind of blowing the O2 uh, directly on your face. I talked about it a little bit ago because that does produce bradycardia. It's essentially, same thing as you sticking your face out of a window when you're driving down the road. Um, I'm sure a lot of you did it as a kid. Uh, it takes your breath away and in turn that can cause a bradycardia. It says O2 toxicity is not a concern. You are not going to over oxygenate kids. Um, they are not COPD patients. We talked about in the past, you're not going to not going to make them O2 toxic. So at times we need to ventilate them with a bag valve mass ventilation is when they're apneic, heart rate's less than 100, they have persistent central cyanosis even though you're given 100% oxygen by blow-by or on a mask. And it says it's not adult equipment. So remember that uh, it does not take much air. And when I say that, when you're pressurizing it, so in other words, how forcefully you squeeze the bag, that opens up their esophagus. When you open up their esophagus, then what that does, that air goes into our gut. You get too much air in your gut. It only has two places to go. It either goes out your butt or it comes out your mouth. Um, it's either going to, so if it comes back out their mouth, any kind of contents that is in their stomach, they're going to blow it right back up. If they take a breath, they get an aspiration of pneumonia. We do not put the bag valve mask, mask and you know, we've talked about that in the past, where you could take a BVM mask, flip it upside down, and then you can ventilate. Remember, that does dry out their mucous membranes. It also dries out their eyes. And in turn, if you're in the right position, you can put that across the bridge of your nose, which can make them vasovagal itself. You can actually stimulate their vagus nerve and make them vasovagal. So try to use infant equipment. We have it in a PD bag. Don't use adult equipment unless you have to. That's literally a very last resort. So your tidal volume needs to be about 7 uh, centimeters or cc's per kilogram or 7 milliliters per kilogram. Ventilation rate is about 40 to 60 a minute. So, you know, essentially we're ventilating every, excuse me, ventilating every second or ventilating about every two seconds. So if the heart rate's less than 60 on chest compressions, this is on a neonate, um, half an inch to an inch at 120 a minute and three to one ratio. Ventilation chest compressions are ineffective, especially if it's important if it's less than 28 weeks gestation because they don't have the respiratory system that uh, someone that is, you know, past that 28 weeks of gestation has because the respiratory system is not developed. And then places the gastric tube, this is ventilated under mass for extended time. Once again, that doesn't affect us currently, but I can see us progressing to OG and NG tubes in the near future. Um, so if you are not able to adequately ventilate them, then it is okay to endotracheal intubate them. Just remember with endotracheal intubation, you have to constantly reassess them because tube placement is key. Last thing you want to do is intubate a kid, you work for it, and then you hit a bump, you don't reassess, it readjusts and it ends up, you know, going into the epiglot, or I'm sorry, into the esophagus, and then you end up blowing a bunch of air into their gut. Medications that we're going to give to the neonatal and the newborn population, epinephrine, fluid, and glucose. These are three most important when we start going into medication. Epinephrine is the only one that we give for bradycardia. Um, obviously a primary that we give for any kind of cardiac arrest. Fluids, fluids, fluids. 20 cc's per kilogram is our big one. And making sure that we check them for any kind of uh, low blood sugar. So let's see if we have to give them glucose. It says um, epinephrine is for a systole or bradycardia. Anything less than 60 a minute, 0 0.01 milligrams per kilogram. We give that every five minutes. It's every three to five minutes. Um, and then it says it can give, be given down the ET tube. And essentially, we just double the dose. And it has 0 0.03 milligrams per kilogram. Um, or you can use it, uh, 0 0.02 milligrams per kilogram. Basically, we're just doubling the dose. Volume expansion. Um, we're considering that if it's power uh, continues actually oxygenation. In other words, they're still pale. And they still look kind of waxy and nasty. Even after we oxygenate them, they have weak pulses after we oxygenate them. They have a poor response to resuscitation efforts. If they have any kind of hemorrhage from the maternal or the fetal unit. It says 10 cc's a kilogram of lactate ringers or normal saline for us over 5 to 10 minutes. Um, 20 cc's is a recommended through Grand Mine Valley EMS Council. Hypoglycemia symptoms, so jitters, lethargy, apnea, color changes, respiratory distress, and seizures. Remember that. They don't present like us. You know, normally when we see hypoglycemic patients that are in the adult population, they're diaphoretic, 
Um, they've got you know, abnormal or ataxic breathing. They you know, are not responding appropriately. They're talking out of their heads. You know, obviously the newborn population and the neonatal population, they don't sweat like we do. They can't talk to you. Um, breathing is a big one. Um, looking at the respiratory distress or any kind of respiratory problems and lethargy. Those are the two key things, and obviously seizures. But, you know, from seizures are fairly easy to look at, but don't miss the color change, respiratory distress, or the lethargy. So hypoglycemia can mimic hypoxemia. So once again, all sick kids need to have their glucose checked. Some hypoglycemic infants are asymptomatic and make sure we consider blood glucose test 20 to 30 minutes postpartum. So you're not going to go wrong checking a kid's blood glucose. Um, if it even crosses your mind that you should, you should. So blood glucose is less than 40 milligrams. Um, can four cc's per kilogram of D10. And it says don't use D50. If we do have to use D50, we need to make sure that we um, basically we separate it and we make sure we give equal parts um, of, of D50 and D25 if you have to split it. And same thing for D10. Most respond to simple measures. Stepwise uh, resuscitation, frequent reassessment, our eight guides of resuscitation. Um, and just keep in mind these numbers the four cc's per kilogram this is all through this is like a pals um, curriculum so this isn't necessarily greater mind valley ems council uh, protocol for how much uh, glucose that we give or how much d10 or d25 we give so it says most respond to simple measures um then the heart rate guides the resuscitation that's key uh Kids who are going to spawn with a heart rate, they're going to start becoming bradycardic long before they start having other symptoms. Um, so always be aware of what their heart rate is. And that kind of guides on what we're going to do, how aggressively we're going to resuscitate them. All right, so the best transport device, it says mom's uterus. There is no doubt about that. That's a couple of different things. Number one, keeping them inside the uterus is a good thing because I only have to take care of one patient. Two, there's no better place than the mom's uterus because they're getting nutrients from the mom. They're getting, you know, getting rid of the waste from the mom through the placenta. And mom's keeping them warm. Second best is a specialized team. Specialized team may be us. It may be the hospital. I talked about that before. Uh, you know, speaking from an ER physician from an adult hospital, uh, you know, husband, my wife will tell you that she'd rather take care of hundred sick, you know, critically sick adults than she would one sick infant. So you need to get them to a specialized team because if you talk to the people that are pediatricians, you know, at the hospitals, they'll tell you that they'd much rather take care of hundred sick kids than they would one sick adult. And it's just, they're both physicians, but they both have their specialties. So making sure we look at axillary temperatures um, or we look at tympanic, or I'm sorry, temporal. Um, 96.5 to 99 degrees. Pulse, 120 to 160. Respiratory rate between 30 to 60. And we're always doing our APGAR scores. Remember, it's every one minute, every five minutes. Don't wait for one minute if you are looking at a sick kid as soon as they are delivered. Keep the airway clear. Maintain their body temperature. And give them humidified oxygen if it is available. Trying to keep their cardiovascular stabilization. Always assist for ventilations if they're cyanotic. Any kind of power, respiratory stress is present. D10 and nasogastric intubation, um, if it's available and it's within our protocol. Always make sure we ha have copies of the infant's mother's and the infant's in the mother's charts. These are things that are very important. So when they, when we write our documentation, when they do our PCR, they need to put one with the infant and one with the mother in their in hospital chart. Make sure it always has the name of the infant, the parents referring the physician, the parents' telephone number, any x-rays that may happen, maternal umbilical cord blood samples, and consent forms. So obviously we don't blow, we don't pull blood samples, but these are all things that um, from a transport standpoint, specialized transport, these are things that we need to make sure that if we do do neonatal transport, specialized, these are things that we need to make sure we have documented. Um, 
This is indication for tocolysis, 20 to 36 weeks gestation, preterm labor, healthy fetus, and a dilate to 4 centimeters or less, and the membranes are intact. Left side position for the mom. Um, supplemental O2, IV fluids, 1 liter of lactate ringers or normal saline. Improves the uterine oxygenation, inhibits the oxytocin release from the posterior pituitary. Uh, beta 2 energic agents, they cause uterine smooth muscle re um, relation. So, you know, obviously we don't give any of those medications. Um, once again, this is from a neonatal transport specialization. Max sulfate, uh, this competes with the calcium at cellular level, blocks the acid and the myosin interaction, inhibits the, con the contraction. Once again, we don't give max sulfate. This is a lecture from that was pre-done, and I'm without changing it. I just want to kind of go through things from a national curriculum standpoint. Okay, that is all we have for the neonatal resuscitation or neonatal lecture.